Hello Cruel World. Robert Napper from 1989 to 1992 was convicted of two murders, one manslaughter, two rapes and two attempted rapes, although he was suspected of committing many more attacks. Napper's victims were usually young, they were usually pretty, they were blonde, they were Caucasian women and they were strangers. But one of the most shocking aspects of his horrific offences was that he often committed them in front of the victim's children. Napper was diagnosed with Asperger's and also with paranoid schizophrenia and he ended up in Broadmoor. What can we say about Napper based on his brutal crimes? Did Napper's Asperger's syndrome contribute to his crimes? Did his schizophrenia? Was his presentation typical of a murderer or a rapist? How do people end up in the Broadmoor Hospital? I'm going to answer all these questions and more within this video. Welcome to A Psych for Sore Minds. I'm your host, Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess and rehabilitate mentally disordered offenders, or what the tabloids might call the criminally insane. I work in prisons and in courts and secure psychiatric units. And I also work as an expert witness, so I advise judges in criminal courts in trials across the UK. And as I said before, I used to work in Broadmoor. So this channel that you're watching dissects a whole range of mental health topics, some related to a Defending in violence, because that's my specialty, like this episode, and some are about mental illnesses that are far more familiar. There are new episodes out every Tuesday, every Friday, so you need to subscribe. There is something for everybody on this channel. This is a series that I'm doing about seven real life patients from Broadmoor. I'm going to offer my professional insights and my theories as a forensic psychiatrist. I actually worked in Broadmoor several years ago as a middle grade psychiatrist. In fact, I talk about my experience of this in my last video. In this series, I've already done, I've already covered Robert Maudsley, who killed four people, one on the streets, one in Broadmoor, two later in prison. I've talked about Ronnie Cray, who's like the celebrity gangster from the 60s who had schizophrenia and I've talked about David Copeland who set off a series of nail bombs in London in 1999 so go check them out. So Robert Napper. Well, let's first talk about his crimes and then we'll delve into his background a little bit. So Robert Napper was born on the 25th of February, 1966, which means that he shares a birthday with Carrot Top, who is a comedian who's clearly had too much Botox, and also Justin Burfield, who plays the older brother in Malcolm in the Middle. Not the oldest, oldest brother, but the second oldest brother, Reese. You know what I'm talking about. So Napper's parents' marriage was violent and Napper witnessed his mother being physically abused by his father. Then his parents divorced when Napa was nine and him and his siblings were placed in foster care. He underwent some psychiatric counselling and he was sexually assaulted by a family friend on a camping holiday when he was around 12 or 13 years old. His first police conviction was for an offence with an air gun. In 1989, a phone call, he made a phone call to his mother where he admitted to raping a woman on Plumstead Common, which is a park in South London. But the problem was is there was no case that matched uh, he, what he claimed and there was no evidence against him. And then in July 1992 in Wimbledon, he stabbed a woman called Rachel Nickel 49 times in front of her son who was only three years old and he was actually questioned for this case but then he was later released. So I've actually done a separate video about the murder of Rachel Nickel and that video is different in that it, it focuses more on that one incident and especially on the uh, police investigation. So there was a, a criminal profiling kind of operation which was led by a renowned forensic psychologist and this actually misled the police so it got them off the scent of the real killer who was Napa because the profile didn't fit Napa. So the police actually had another suspect in mind and they set up a honey trap. So an undercover attractive female police officer tried to coax a confession out of somebody who turned out to be innocent. But anyway, that's a whole other story covered in detail in my other video. You should go check it out. Eventually, the DNA evidence traced back to Napa and that's how he got found out. But anyway, this video is on a different topic. So it focused more on Napa and his psychological makeup. So in November 1993, Napa committed another assault and the victim was named Samantha Bissett and this was in her home which was in Plumstead. So Napa stabbed her in the neck and in the chest and then he killed her and then sexually assaulted her and then, and this bit is pretty horrific, he smothered her four-year-old daughter named Jasmine. Then he mutilated the body of Samantha Bissett and he took away parts as a trophy and a fingerprint was found at the crime scene which later was linked to Napa and that led to his arrest. So Napa was convicted of murder and he, he, he admitted two rapes and to attempted rapes at the time, though he was thought to have carried out around 70 savage attacks across southeast London 
over a four year period ending in 1994. So what I think is quite interesting is he was suspected of the case initially, but he was eliminated due to his height. So he's six foot two, and he, he was thought as being too tall to be the culprit that they were looking for. Although later on, the police figured out that actually he walked with a stoop. So Napa was detained at Broadmoor Hospital indefinitely from December 2008. That's when he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and Asperger's. And soon afterwards, he was convicted of the manslaughter of Rachel Nickel, which had happened many years earlier on the grounds of diminished responsibility. So diminished responsibility is a partial psychiatric defense and it downgrades murder to manslaughter. I've talked about it a few times in different videos, most recently the one I did about David Copeland. Go check it out. So let's have a look at the various factors that might have contributed to Napa's horrific crimes. So firstly, he might have modelled violence that he witnessed by his father towards his mother as a way of conflict resolution. We also know that he was sexually assaulted by a family friend during a camping holiday when he was about 12 or 13. So that might have confused and warped his very concept of like boundaries and about sex, particularly because he has Asperger's syndrome. So I've done other videos where I talk about autistic spectrum disorder in more depth. A good example would be Alec Minassian, who intentionally killed 10 random pedestrians. Go check out that video. Very briefly, autistic spectrum disorder covers a whole range of disorders and symptoms of autism occur in three main areas, which are social interaction, verbal and non-verbal communications, and repetitive or ritualistic behaviors. So Asperger's syndrome is on this spectrum and it's a version of autism, but it's less severe and there's no language delays. But as I said, it can lead to a lack of understanding social interactions and social norms. So that might have contributed to Napa's struggling to understand empathy, sex, normal interactions, acceptable boundaries. I think one thing that we can learn about the brutality of the murder scene is that it indicates to me that he had an absolute lack of empathy or connection to his victim. I mean, he must have seen like the fear in the eyes of the victims, especially the kids. But despite this, he just saw them as objects for his pleasure, not as human beings. People with autistic spectrum disorder, they struggle with the cognitive element of empathy. So that's seeing people's other people's perspective, although they can have the normal emotional empathy. So being able to feel remorse or care about how other people feel. So I just wanted to make it really, really clear that the vast majority of people with autistic spectrum disorder or in fact schizophrenia would not act so violently. And I think in this case, it's likely to be related to Napa's own horrific childhood experiences. I'm just saying that these are one of many potential factors that contributed. So on top of all of this, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. What I think is quite interesting is that the murder scene of Bisset, there are reports that there were two voices heard at the scene and later they were thought to both have been produced by Napa. So it seems like he was talking to himself in two different voices, which I have to say is very bizarre. Are. I've never seen this in my professional career. I've assessed hundreds of patients who hear voices, but I've never heard of one creating two distinct characters speaking to each other. So I think this indicates that he was probably very psychotic at the time and also is quite a disturbed individual. Another major factor is that Napa was said to be delusional. So I wonder how his delusions fed into his crime. And to be honest, it depends on the content and the nature of his delusions. And I can't know that without assessing him personally or unless I see the reports by the forensic psychiatrists who assessed him at the time. But I would say that I've given evidence as an expert witness in other trials where people have killed because of bizarre delusions that they genuinely believed. If you want an example of this, you'll be able to find a good one on my video on Andrea Yates. So if you don't know, she is a mother who killed her own five children in Texas in 2001. And at the time she was suffering delusions about the devil forcing her to do it. But I think in Napa's case, it had much more to do with sexual gratification plus his history of being abused himself. So I think a lot of people have like a stereotypical view. I think there's this misconception that murderers and rapists are just like these very creepy, scary men who wander around in dark alleys at night and they all have trench coats, they all have these beards I mean you know I've got a beard but not like this one you know this is more this is more more hipster than it is murderer but actually in reality for women in about 90% of the time they're killed by somebody they know and three quarters of the time it happens in their own home and similar to this in rapes about 90% of the time the the perpetrator is known to the victim and around a quarter of the time, it's an ex-partner. So being killed by a stranger in a public place like a park, like Napa, is actually extremely rare. 
So in terms of personality and countenance, from my experience of working with defendants who've committed a whole range of offences, some of which are very serious, I basically think that people are unpredictable. So some patients and defendants are quiet, they're quite meek and they're calm, yet they've com committed horrific offences. Conversely, you see some defendants who are quite boisterous, quite loud, quite outwardly hostile, but they're not actually that dangerous on paper if you, if you drill down to their previous offences. So for these people, their bark is worse than their bite. So how do people end up in Broadmoor Hospital? Well, first let's talk in general terms of how they end up in forensic units. So mentally disordered offenders often come from prisons or they come from courts, either during their trial or if they're already sentenced as a prisoner. And sometimes they come from other hospitals where the aggression and the violence has escalated. So in those cases, they sometimes haven't committed a formal offence, but they just can't be managed. People who go to forensic units are usually under criminal sections of the Mental Health Act as opposed to the civil sections, which is what's used for the average person. So section two and section three are probably ones that you might have heard of. Those are civil sections. So that is how a forensic unit works. For high secure hospitals, they have to pose a grave and imminent risk of serious harm to the public. So what that basically means is if they were released tomorrow, then it's very likely that they would hurt somebody and they would hurt them seriously. As opposed to somebody in a medium secure unit or lower who might have longer term eventual risks, but they're not immediate. And those risks are not necessarily severe like uh, loss of life. It's actually quite a big deal to admit somebody to a high secure unit. And it's a very important decision because it's so expensive. So it costs about a quarter of a million pounds. And on top of that, the admissions in a place like Broadmoor are very long. About a quarter of the patients stay there for over 10 years. So it's a very slow process, which is why the decision is taken so seriously. So Broadmoor actually has an admissions panel and I've sat on, uh, well, I'm sorry, I've, I've sat and I've observed this panel while I used to work there. I've watched the process. So they would have several referrals coming in from all over the south of the country and they could only take a small proportion of the very riskiest, most dangerous patients. So from my experience, one murder in itself is not necessarily enough. It's usually multiple murders, unless it was one murder, but it was like extremely brutal or sadistic. Uh, or repeated sexual assaults. Again, one isn't usually enough. It has to be um, a whole catalogue of them. And mostly the patients are acutely psychotic and many of them have treatment resistant psychosis. So they've been trialed on lots of different medications, but they still don't get better and they still commit repeated violence. Sometimes patients escalate from medium secure units because those units just can't deal with that level of violence. For example, I remember I saw a man in a medium secure unit where I worked who'd stabbed another patient seemingly randomly in the face uh, using this makeshift shiv from a toothbrush and a blade and he was placed in medium security, in, in seclusion in medium security. And whilst this happened, the nurses searched his room and they found several other makeshift weapons. So obviously he was very dangerous, couldn't be contained in that hospital. Very occasionally you get specific special circumstances where people are sent to high secure, such as somebody repeatedly set, trying to set fires inside a hospital. So even if they themselves are not that violent, their behavior is so risky that it needs to go to high secure hospital or somebody who repeatedly takes staff hostages, or if there's somebody who constantly tries to abscond or escape, or even if they have a gang on the outside that tries to help them escape, then those are all reasons where they might need a high level of security. So I'm going to tell you about my next episode of A Psych for Sore Minds, but first I'm excited to share some news with you guys, which is this. I'm going to be a speaker at CrimeCon UK. So it's a massive crime convention, really popular in the States, coming over to the UK. It was supposed to be in June, but it's now been delayed because of coronavirus to September. You will hear about serial killers, unsolved crimes. You will hear from criminologists, law enforcement agents, and your favorite true crime podcasters. I'll be doing a talk, which is about two real life cases of people who've killed their own family members. One who, uh, both of whom I've assessed, one who was mentally ill and one who was not. If you really are a true crime enthusiast, you cannot miss out on this event. Use the link below to get tickets and use the code PSYCH if you want to get 10% off. So this is a series about real life Broadmoor patients and delving into their histories and their psyches. 
I'm yet to do one on Kenneth Erskine, otherwise known as the Stockwell Strangler, and also the Yorkshire Ripper. So as well, in each episode, as well as giving you general facts about their crimes and backgrounds, which you can get anywhere, I will give you my personal insights from my professional experience of working in forensic psychiatry, including in Broadmoor. I just want to give a quick shout out to my homeboy, Joshua Miles. He's your future favorite true crime YouTuber. You have to check out his channel. He's got lots of fascinating videos. Show him some love and subscribe. So the next person on my list to talk about is the infamous Charles Bronson. You might have heard of him. He was convicted of armed robbery in 1974, and he was initially sentenced to only seven years in prison, which is not that serious really, but he kept bump, uh, jumping between Broadmoor and prison, and he committed so much violence in these institutes that it escalated until his sentence reached 40 years. He's also played by Tom Hardy in a film named My What a Fetching Mustache. Uh, not only kidding, it's just called Bronson. Anyways, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Not only does it help me out immeasurably, but it automatically makes your breath smell minty fresh. I would appreciate it if you commented a bit more in the videos. I've enjoyed having a chat with you guys recently. Until then, please follow us on Instagram, like our Facebook page. Feel free to reach out if you have any requests or questions. Uh, I do some episodes once in a while where I answer people's questions. So uh, if you reach out, then I will try and address it at some point. You can email us at our address, which is psychforsoreminds at gmail.com. If you're gonna reference us, use the hashtag PsychSaw. Please tell your favorite people about Psych for Saw Minds. We're growing slowly, but I don't think we're anywhere near our potential. Your favorite people deserve to jump on this gravy train. They deserve it. Spread the love. Until next time, stay euthymic, and please do not forget, I love you. <laughs>